study last night at the Wheelanders. Um, how many here have ever gotten to be at Nick's Bible study in Key Marathon? Uh, two of us? Three of us? Well, it's a really neat opportunity. If ever you get bored on a Tuesday night and uh, want to add one more extra little service to your week, um, run on down the Key Marathon and Nick and his Bible study will be glad to have you. It was a great time and me and Eric and Ann showed up. Ann looked great and me and Eric looked like we just crawled out of the ocean, which is sort of what we'd done. Well, <clears throat> anyway, um, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 73. Psalm chapter 73, if you want the whole story on that and how we survived four tornadoes and uh, a dead engine. Sounds almost like John, or I mean Paul Bunyan, but uh, it was a great time. Ask us about it later. Psalm chapter 73. Tonight we'll be looking about, um, basically we'll see two perspectives from this song, psalm. We'll see an earthly perspective and we'll see a heavenly perspective. And uh, Psalm 73, we'll read the first verse and pray. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word and for the many good things you have in it for us. Please bless me and fill me with your power as I preach and give me wisdom in the words I say. Please be with us as we're looking into your word that we'd be changed by it, that we would see our lives and the way things go in our lives and the way things go in others' lives also with an eternal perspective and not with our own gain in mind. Be with us, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Asaph was a, uh, he was a priest and he was responsible for writing a number of the psalms here between Psalm 73 and I think it's around Psalm 80. He uh, wrote quite a number of really interesting psalms. David wrote most of the psalms, but Asaph managed to get a few in there. And if you read the little uh, superscription on top of the psalms, the, uh, um, it, Moses actually managed to get a psalm in here, Psalm 90. And uh, the little superscription's actually inspired, and the original Hebrew was actually part of the verse. Um, so where it says, like, on top of this psalm, a psalm of Asaph, it, uh, it actually is inspired. Interestingly, the book of Psalms and the book of Lamentations are the only two books which actually have original chapter divisions. The rest of the Bible, you know, they didn't have any kind of chapter divisions, but they originally had all the Psalms. Each Psalm's divided out into its own several Psalm, just as the book of Lamentations is divided out into its five chapters and arranged in a really interesting way, um, which isn't tonight's study, but just for your information about the book of Psalms. It's, uh, it's really pretty fascinating, and uh, each one was really meant as kind of a worship song, for the temple and uh, for other things. They're great songs of Christian experience and actually a lot of the songs in our hymn books have direct quotes uh, or at least subtle allusions to the psalm. So, Well, Asaph was one of the singers in the temple. He was a priest and this is what he said. Truly God is good to Israel even to such as are of a clean heart. So a good way to start the psalm. God is good to Israel, especially to those who are of a clean heart. And uh, that's true. And that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. But this is what he says in verse 2, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He had forgotten about how good God was. And we see in verse 3 why he had slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. The psalm, this psalm here raises a question of why do the wicked get to prosper? And um, really it answers it not with giving a direct answer of this is why the wicked get to prosper, but it answers the real question behind the question, why do the wicked prosper? Ever wondered why it seems, why does it seem that I'm doing right but bad stuff's happening and the person who's dishonest is he's doing wrong and he's doing wicked things but everything seems to be great for him? Or the bad people who do bad things to good people, why do they seem to triumph and be prosperous? And this psalm answers the real question behind that question. And um, first though, before we get to that, we'll look at uh, the earthly perspective 
on both the wicked and on oneself the Christian, asking the question. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So his problem first here is covetousness. And really, you could almost title this sermon tonight, Thou Shalt Not Covet, but um, that's not what we did. So I was envious at the foolish when enviousness and covetousness starts in our hearts. It really should raise a flag. But this is why he became envious. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt, and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. So Asaph here takes a look at the ungodly, and he looks at them and says, When they die, everything seems like it's going great for them. And they don't seem to have problems, they don't seem to have plagues upon them. Um, because nothing ever happens to them, pride encompasses them as a chain. This is a subtle accusation against God. They're proud because they've gotten away with any, everything, and so because God has allowed them to get away with everything, he's the one who's permitted them to be proud. It seems very easy when we as believers watch things not going right to get upset about it and to start blaming God for it, to start blaming God for letting the wicked win, to start getting upset at God for allowing the wicked to do well when we think that they should be judged. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They got everything. And uh, there's nothing which they want which they can't have. They're corrupt and speak wickedly. So then he looks at all the things they have and then he starts talking about the things they do. They're corrupt and um, they speak wickedly. These are the sort of people who, uh, who cheat others in their business dealings, who oppress other people, who take from others. They... Uh, they do all kinds of wrong things and nothing ever seems to happen to them. And not only do they do wrong things to other people, but they speak, they set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. They speak bad against God, they speak bad against everybody, and nobody seems to be able to stop these sorts of people. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup wrung out to them. I'm not quite sure all of exactly what that would entail, but basically his people are provided for and um, they're able to continue in their wicked ways without any kind of hindrance. <clears throat> and they say, How doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? And I've even heard wicked people sometimes say something like this, Well, if God's really real, why doesn't he just stop me from what I'm doing? Or, yeah, well, that's fine. God will stop me whenever he's ready to. Or uh, something like that. I've heard people say, not quite those words, but very similar to it. And, um, well, he then looks at himself and says, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. Asaph, in his frustration, says, It's, it's all for nothing that I got saved. I got saved and it's not even benefiting me any. I washed my hands in innocence. You know, he's trying to do right and he says that it's just not benefiting him any. What good is it? The wicked do bad and wickedly and horribly and I try to do right and things are bad. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. So the wicked man gets up in the morning and has everything he wants as I stand out with fatness and he gets to speak against God, speak against man, do whatever he wants and gets away with it. And I'm chastened every morning and everything is going badly for me. Asaph is going through quite a bit here, it would seem. And he's going through a whole lot of turmoil inside his soul. And in verse 15, he says, If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should again offend against the generation of thy children. He says, and I can't even go ahead and say what I'm feeling really because if I would, it would offend all the fellow believers. And uh, so, he's really, he's in great turmoil here. 
He doesn't know what to say, he doesn't know what to do, the wicked are winning, and he's miserable. Poor Asaph. And this is a bad position for a Christian to be in. To be looking at the wicked, to be considering the wicked, to be wishing that we had what the wicked have. This is not, um, it's never good for a person to covet, but it's especially bad for a person to, to look at the methods and the ways of the wicked and wish that, that we could do what they did and get away with it. Um, because they do it too. God doesn't judge them. Why is it we get in trouble when we do wrong? Ever felt like that? Well, we then begin to see a heavenly perspective on things. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me, verse 16 and 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So we see here, in the start, he was looking at them and all the good things which seemed to be happening to him. Now he looks at the real end of things. By the way, are all wicked people really doing really well? No, they really aren't. Asaph was seeing things through a... Uh, well, he really wasn't seeing things very logically. And when people start not, when people start getting envious and jealous and looking at the grass at the other side of the fence, it always looks a lot greener. And it always ends up being a lot worse when you get there. The wicked, they don't really get blessed in all these good things like they, we think that they are when we're looking at them and being envious and jealous of the good things that we think they're getting when we're being miserable. He says, this is about the end of the wicked. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest this, them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. So he looks at what really happens. In the end, the wicked don't win. God judges wickedness, and the unsaved when they do wickedly, they will be judged in eternity. They'll burn forever for their sins. And that's not something we should wish upon them, but it's a real truth, and when we're busy envying the wicked, we should um, consider that there's no benefit in envying what leads to eternal judgment. When a person rejects God and figures he can live however he wants, it turns out very badly for them. It also turns out badly for believers who decide to reject the ways of God and live in sin. It's very possible for a believer to be jealous of backslidden believers. I go to church all the time and it seems all I ever do is serve God. I don't have any time to do the things I want to do. And these believers who are backslidden and they aren't really serving God, it seems that they have all the time to do what they want. It seems that their life is easy. They don't have to dedicate all their time and their tithes and their talents and everything else which starts with T to God and anything else. And they get away with everything. And um, it's not right for a believer ever to envy the ways of the wicked. Because there's always judgment in the end. Always, always, always does God judge sin. So God never lets anyone ever get away with sin. And um, God always evens things out in the end, if you will. There will always be eternal ramifications for sin, either in the life of a believer or in the life of the lost. Um, we'll be looking at here in just a little bit later the uh, ramifications of obedience and disobedience in the life of a believer but it's sufficient to say for the moment that no one ever gets away with anything ever and so when we're busy being envious and we're busy being jealous it's important for us to remember that the people we're busy looking at and the, gra the grass which the uh, bad horses are busy eating isn't as green as we think it is First Asaph looks at the wicked and gets envious at them. Then he looks at himself and is miserable at how bad things seem to be. Then he looks at the wicked through an eternal perspective. He goes to church, if you will, and gets his heart right with God. He, he's in the temple and probably praying or something, and God opens his eyes to the way things really are. And so then he looks at himself and says this in verse 21, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. So first he repents of his ways. And he realizes his enviousness, his jealousy, his being about to slip, these sins of his heart which almost destroyed him. 
they uh they really were quite bad. When a believer takes to coveting, what we're doing is really accusing God of being unjust for not giving us what we think that we deserve. We're saying that God isn't good enough, that God can't provide, that God cannot supply, that um well that we're better than God and we know better for our lives than what God knows and uh, if God had any sense he'd listen to us on the things we uh, keep bothering him about and would um, well give us the things we keep asking for because the wicked have them all too when we approach God like this it, uh, it's really is indicative of a heart which isn't really looking for things the way God wants them God does want to bless us and God does bless believers greatly this is not to say that sometimes believers do not go through hard times and bad trials and struggles. Sometimes we go through them because we're sinful and because we're just getting what we deserve for them. And we're just reaping what we sowed as or, um, poor spending habits or poor planning habits or uh, um, even something as simple as forgetting to put diesel in your truck can cause you all kinds of problems down the road and you really can't blame God for them. It's your own fault. By the way, um, I only ran out of diesel once, and it wasn't entirely my fault. I didn't know there was a valve I was supposed to flip, but it was pretty funny. Anyway, um, so when something happens which is a result of our sin or a result of our carelessness or something like that, it's against the rules to blame it on God, and we have one person and one person only to blame it on. And um, when we stop blaming it on others and just take the blame for ourselves, it makes things a whole lot easier to fix and deal with. Well, God does bring trials, though, into a believer's life to purge us, to cleanse us, to prepare us for future ministry, um, to open our eyes to the lost around us and to His goodness and so many other things. And when God is doing this to us, it's not a curse, it's a blessing, and it's a help to us. It's very important to keep an eternal perspective on things, and Asaph, in the trials he was going through, he says, he was looking at it through earthly eyes, and he realizes that looking at the earth, or the things of this earth, and through earthly eyes is foolish. So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. If we look at our lives our own way instead of God's way, we're foolish, ignorant, and beast-like, and we'll come to misery like Asaph did. But look what happens in verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Remember what the father said to the older son. Son, I am ever with thee, and all that thou hast is mine. It's as if Asaph, the older son, who was miserable about the younger sons running away and getting in all kinds of trouble and having no results from it, hears the father's call and responds, saying, I am continually with thee. Thou hast told me by my right hand. He acknowledges God's goodness to him, that God has always been with him, and um, he returns in the fellowship with God. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Do the ungodly have the, God, the counsel of God here on this earth? This is a major privilege a Christian who is living right has, is that he can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, he can receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit, he has the peace of God available to him. He has answered prayers, and none of these things the wicked have. When the wicked are scrabbling about to get another dollar, to cheat another person, to harm another, they, they don't have any of these blessings. When a saved person is backslidden, he doesn't have any of those blessings either. And um, having God with us, having the counsel of God in our lives is a tremendous blessing. And the next thing is, is afterward, receive me to glory. The wicked don't get to look forward to that, do they? The wicked get to look forward to, well, not really a whole lot. Most wicked people don't really want to think about eternity. And uh, um, they honestly, it's, it's just not something they enjoy. They like to kind of tuck it away and just, well, as I've seen t-shirts and bumper stickers, he who dies with the most toys wins and also dies. Verse 25 whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. So he's completely changed. 
First, he's looking at the earth and whining because he doesn't have what he wants or because things are going bad and the wicked are winning and things are hard. And then he looks and says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. When we set our hearts on God, and when we singularly set our life and focus on God and the things of God, God takes care of us and provides for us. Where's a verse in the Bible which describes this? The provision of God. Exactly it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Looking for prosperity? Well, look for God's prosperity. And that doesn't necessarily mean rolling around in a Rolls, Rolls Royce with spinner rims. But God will give you great happiness and joy and provide for all your needs and make it so you don't have all kinds of covetousness in your life so you won't want crazy rims on your car anyway or whatever things you may be coveting. I don't think people like those as much as they used to. I used to see them all the time, but it seems they've gone out of style. Anyway, there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. When we desire God and the things of God, it makes our lives happy. When that's what we want, when we want God's will, when we want the things that God has for us, when we're earnestly seeking after God and we receive the answer to prayer, which um, is very plainly described in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. When we receive that answer, the answer of God drawing nigh to us, our life is wonderful. All of a sudden it's, I want what the wicked have. Now it's, I want heaven and I want God. I want heaven on earth which is the fellowship and walking with God and letting God take care of our needs, letting God answer our prayers. By the way, God does take care of all our needs. And when we come upon Him and we pray, He'll take care of them and supply them. And often much better and quicklier than we could have ever imagined them being taken care of and in so much more wonderful a way if we'll just wait for Him to supply it instead of trying to fulfill the needs ourselves. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. 26. His flesh and his heart fails. Well, eventually... We're all going to die one day eventually if the Lord doesn't return first. And as we get older, our flesh and our heart fails. And as more trials and troubles come upon us, eventually the, the strengths we had of this life begin to fade away. It's just the nature of life. And as Peter likes to call it, entropy. He usually uses that to describe that as his room. Um, anyway, things in this life don't last forever. But when God is our strength and God is our portion then everything is okay, and everything's great. Verse 27, let's look back at the wicked again. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. The wicked, the ones we were jealous and envious of back in verse 3, these ones are all perishing, and they're all being destroyed even as we... Even as we're here tonight, the wicked have their judgments coming, and they're going to be going to hell if they don't get saved first. Verse 28, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It's good for us to draw near to God. It's good for us because it gets our heart off the miseries and unrests of this world. When we look to the wicked, we get the miseries and unrests the wicked have. The wicked aren't happy when they get like all kinds of money, big houses, big cars, and all these things. They still end up committing suicide. All kinds of millionaires have committed suicide, and it really didn't help them being a millionaire any. There's all kinds of people who are empty people, both rich and poor, who are living wickedly, and their wickedness isn't answering their prayers, and their wickedness isn't satisfying them. As one rich man once said, well, how rich do you want to be? And he said, um, interestingly, just one dollar more. And perhaps he was making fun of the person he was answering it to. I don't know if he was being serious or not. Might have just said it just for fun, but... Anyway, the, um, the heart of things is, is, is that no one is ever satisfied with the things of this world. 
The wicked, when his eyes stand out with fatness and he has more than heart could desire, still desires. And when we looked at them in covetousness, we are, we're really, we're really um, saying really bad things about God in our heart. The God who loved us and died for us and wants to provide us all things. We as believers look forward to great heavenly blessings and treasures. There is vast reward in eternity awaiting a believer who will live for God. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 describes um, the judgment seat of Christ. And standing there and the things done in this life, being either gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, and the fire trying them. The bad things burn up, and if a man's works are gold, silver, precious stones, he receives a reward, the Bible says. But if they burn up, then he suffers loss, yet himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. It's like he just barely escaped the burning building of all the useless works of his life. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, to give an account of the things done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. The Greek word for judgment seat there is bema. Maybe you've heard it referred to as the bema seat judgment. Anyway, what that was was usually kind of like an awards <coughs> table at the end of like an Olympic Games or something. You'd have some judges sitting behind there, and the winners would receive crowns. They would receive rewards for the victories they had accomplished. There is no Christian purgatory. Christians don't have to burn off a little bit of extra sin. Um, athletes who failed didn't get beaten at the Bama seat. They just didn't receive reward. So there's great rewards God has for us in eternity. But the book of Revelation talks about us living and reigning forever with him, serving forever with him. It talks about all these things, and there are vast ramifications for a believer to do right for all eternity. There's vast ramifications when a sinner rejects God, he burns for all eternity. There's vast ramifications for a backslider who never gets his life right with God, and that is, is well, at the judgment seat, it talks about in uh, Mark 8, 38, um, Christ will be ashamed of him, and no one wants Christ to be ashamed of him at the judgment seat. There's also vast, vast ramifications of a believer who lives for Christ, and that is, is that God will be pleased and he'll receive great eternal rewards. So, when Satan tempts you to covet, to look at the whatever the wicked have, realize he's lying and it's not that good for the wicked. It's not even that good in this life for the wicked and in eternity it's much, much worse for them. And look to God and look to his goodness and go ahead and cry out this prayer. Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none that I desire on earth beside thee. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word and for your great goodness to us. That you give us all things richly and that um, all things are ours in Christ's and that you provide for all our needs and that we don't need to be coveting anything. That you're our shepherd and we don't need to want. Help us please not to live lives of covetousness and just wishing maybe that we could have things a little better. Or Help us to see that everything is already great in our life if we'll just live for you and let you take control and um, follow your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Any prayer requests? Jonathan. Pray for me, my Jonathan and his family.